Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Big C webinar. And for those of you that were confused when that came out, it's the Facilitative Information Gathering Conference under MCR 3.224. So today we have a fabulous panel. Um, Sahara Housie is a referee with the Oakland County Friend of Court, and she is a past chair of the Family Law Section. Liz Bransdorfer is another past chair of the Family Law Section, and she's a private practitioner at Micah Myers in Grand Rapids. And we have Tony McDowell, who is the friend of court for Genesee County. And Tony participated a couple of years ago when in Ingham County, at least, when we did um, a, a whole laying out the new court rule for all the attorneys. We did this, uh, the Family Law Section did a tour around the state and Lansing was one of them and Tony participated and we really appreciated his help. So we wanted him to come back today. So first of all, welcome and thank you um, to our panelists. And I'll get us started with Tony, who's gonna just give us a quick overview of um, the fig seat process in the court rule. Now, remember there is chatting. You can put information in the chat at some point. I'm gonna be asking you for information. So just know that you can put stuff in the chat if you have a question. It's probably better to put it under the Q&A button that's, that is at the bottom of your screen. And I'll make sure if we, for some reason, don't get to answer your question live during the presentation, I'll make sure we get some sort of answer for you after the fact. Um, so just so you know that in case we don't have time to get to all the questions. So Tony, take it away. All right. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Um, as Lisa pointed out, uh, facilitative informational gathering conference is way too much to say. So I'm only going to say fig from here on out. So uh, don't expect me to be able to say all those words again. Um, so first, I think we'll start with just kind of generally what the, the court rule is, right? So the court rule, the FOC alternative dispute resolution ADR uh, court rule has uh, three different options. And um, every county needed to have, every court needed to have a local administrative order outlining how they were going to have an ADR plan. And that was back in January of, uh, see, January, 2020. So everybody had to put one together. And so basically um, what the three options are is mediation, uh, joint meeting, and figs, which we're going to try to talk about a little bit uh, here today, even though, um, but part of the reason why we want to talk about it, I think, is because a lot of counties are, and courts are still using mediation and joint meeting and not really using FIGS, and Genesee County falls into that category. Uh, we do a lot of mediation, but we don't do that many FIGS. We only do FIGS when they're ordered. Um, what for a lot of people, uh, what figs are a replacement for is conciliation. So conciliation existed for a really long time. And then the fig is really intended to be the replacement. So I have two questions. Genesee County didn't do conciliation. That's why before. that was my question. Yeah. All right. Fine. We okay. did in Ingham County. So I was like, really, did you guys not do conciliations? And that's yeah, why. So okay. we didn't do, we didn't do conciliation prior to the new uh, ADR rule. So no really change there. Um, so we actually added a feature that we didn't have before um, in Genesee County. So, um, that's, that's for a lot of counties that were really used to conciliation, when they saw FIG, they went, oh, what, what is this? And really, it's, it's intended to be a replacement for conciliation. It's intended to be a, a quick resolution. Where the intention is to try to make it be as quick as possible to, to resolve these issues for the families. So that's kind of what, in a nutshell, that, that ADR court rule is and some of the things that we each county is supposed to have, each court's supposed to have, and um, basically what the FIG is. It's intended to be kind of like conciliation, intended to be a really quick resolution of, of issues. So, Something um, less than mediation. There are some specific features to the, the court rule, the FIG court rule. Um, which is subsection F, and we're going to get it to, into those a little bit later today, um, such as a domestic violence screening. And But I am really curious, and before, I'm going to have Liz and Sahara tell us what's happening in their respective counties. Um, but if you if you do know whatever county you're practicing in, or if you happen to be a referee or friend of court personnel um, attending today, if you could just put in the chat, tell us what your county is doing. Um, that would be super helpful. What, what I would like to do is circulate a list uh, just basically of what's going on that we know about just from today. Um, so feel free to put that in the chat to everybody.
everybody so we can all see what's going on. And I know I have a, I've had a couple of people also email me. So we'll make sure we, we do some sort of compilation just to share what information we do have. Um, so Sahara, can you tell us what's happening in Oakland County? Right, and I was just gonna put in the um, chat that for our county, we do have the AO, um, administrative order as Tony mentioned, and ours is 2019-16. And Suzanne Hollier is president in case you want to speak to her. But so that outlines ours. And, and as I explained before, our county, like Genesee County, does not do figs. We really focus more on the joint meetings. Um, and just to touch base, that domestic screening is for all of them, regardless of which ADR process you use. That's part of each of those three different ones. But for us, we tend to focus more on the joint meetings. And Liz, what's happening over in Kent County? Well, um, let me start with Ottawa County because Ottawa oh. County did used to do conciliations mm -hmm. automatically on the new filing of every case. Parties got invited to the friend of the court for a conciliation, and they are using FIG conferences for that purpose now. And um, the, the new court rule clarified the requirement for domestic violence screening. It clarified that attorneys are allowed to be to participate not just be present and sit in the room. So there, it made some changes in the process, um, changes that I think are for the better. Kent County, like Oakland and, and Genesee, apparently did not automatically do conciliations. So the friend of the court in Kent County doesn't do them unless ordered. Um, Barry County appears to use the FIG process anytime a case gets referred over to them. Oh, and I wanted to say about Kent, if the judges send them over for what we used to call troubleshooting, which is a, a motion for temporary order that the judge doesn't feel like they can decide on a, an attorney only argument on a Friday morning, they will often send them for a conference at front of the court the next week, Thursday. And I believe the front of the court is using the FIG format to do that try to get the parties to agree and then make a recommendation if they don't. Um, I was just ask, actually asking somebody if they could chime in for us. Um, but before I, I'm not gonna put anybody on the spot without getting their permission. So um, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> Let's talk, and I see some people I know from Ingham County, so I'm trying to grab, I'm trying to grab an Ingham County person because I know um, it's, things are a little bit different in Ingham County as well. Anyway, um, let's talk about what, let's talk about the domestic violence screening. Um, and I know we have some tools, Tony, you circulated something among the panelists and we're gonna share that. SCAO has developed a lot of tools um, to help attorneys and forms. So uh, Tony, if you could maybe address um, the forms that you sent and then I don't, um, whichever, anybody that wants to address domestic violence screening, I would love to hear the feedback and maybe it's being done differently in different counties as well. Sure, I'll jump in. So um, it's the FOC 124 is the, the name of the form and that's the domestic violence screening form that uh, SCAO uh, made available to everybody who is doing the ADR, any of the ADR, ADR as Sarah pointed out. So, um, that is, uh, that's the screening tool. The idea is basically that that screening tool is going to be sent out to the families in advance of the FIG so that everybody gets a chance to fill it out um, and that whoever is conducting the FIG is going to check to make sure that we actually got that, that form before we proceed. And SEAO is very firm on saying, don't move forward. Don't move forward at all until you have that in hand. If, if even if the both parties show up, say you're doing a Zoom, as many of us are these days, uh, still don't really move forward unless you get that, that screening done and that uh, FOC 124 is the form. So uh, that's, that's the, the process there. They, SEAO is a big believer that it should be in writing. Um, that you should not uh, just take somebody saying, yep, we're good to go. Um, so that's, that's a big part of the process. And then um, what the other part of the DV screening is that if the court finds that there is DV on a case, then they need to hold a hearing uh, addressing whether the, a FIG can move forward. And if the FOC finds that there's DV, then they need to, a party who has the domestic violence experience, and then 
also uh, take steps. Uh, so there's different steps that you can take, um, whether that's, you know, meeting at different times. Zoom is, you know, one potential option to uh, addressing a DD situation, uh, allowing advocates or attorneys, uh, which obviously, as Liz pointed out, the court will specifically says that attorneys can be present and can participate. So that can sometimes be an option. And then if you're in person, just separate rooms, those sorts of things. So um, basically, uh, there, the form needs to be filled out. Uh, and then uh, whatever waivers may need to be there, and then uh, steps to make it so that it's safe for everybody. Yeah, Lisa, I was on the committee that helped develop the, the um, domestic violence screening form at SCAO. And, and I'm delighted to hear from Tony that they are communicating to all the friend of the courts how serious they are about this being required. Um, there, there was consensus among the attorney participants in that work group that most of the counties were ignoring that and not doing any kind of screening. Before the form, before the form was established, yeah, I mean, and if they were doing any, it was that it was that form you fill out with filing. Is there a PPO or a, mm -hmm. a criminal case or a, a um, child abuse and neglect case? They weren't asking any of these kinds of questions. Um, so I would also say, if anybody is finding that your county is not doing domestic violence screening in advance. Um, there is a receptive ear at SCAO. Um, I mean, obviously try to talk with your local FOC first and see if you can get them to improve their process. But if they ignore you, SCAO will listen. So it's interesting. And I want to hear what Sarah has to say about Oakland County's use of domestic violence screening. But back when we did the, um, the in-person meeting town hall in February of 2020 in Ingham County, uh, at the time, the you know, virtual is not a thing, right? That was right before everything switched to Zoom. But at the time, Ingham County was still doing it, you know, when people arrive at the courthouse and we had mm -hmm. questions about, well, like, how are you separating them and, and how is that working? It sounds like the idea of the form is that it's done in advance, right? So that we have the form before anybody shows up at the courthouse, we already know the situation on the ground. Um, and I would love to hear feedback from the audience if that's how it's working for your county. Sahara, do you have anything to share? Yeah, so in our office, not only do we use this form, we also have a form that's submitted at the time with the EIC forms, right? So in our old world, you know, they'd come in, we'd have them fill out these forms and this should be submitted. But this one is sent privately, it's scanned confidential, and it is a pre-screening for DV as well. So there's this form. And obviously this is also required when we references, right? Outside from this ADR or different um, when there's an order of reference to a custody and parenting time specialist, they're also required to do screening. And we sometimes get, um, we send it to our warrants department to actually get their record. So that also helps to see if there's anything else. Um, I'm actually gonna try to share a screen, which I should be able to do. Who can share? Sure, all panelists, but I just wanna actually share. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna show you the form really quickly that SCAO has developed for us. Um, so what I, while I'm showing the form, so it has lots of room to put information about what the situation is, what does the friend of court do with this? If somebody says there's domestic violence, is that just the end of the story? Like we're not gonna question whether the allegations are true or not. If it's alleged that's enough, we're gonna take it out of the, 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 the court, you know, the, the MCR 3224 context altogether, which includes FIGC or, and, and does it then it just, only go in front of the judge. So I guess how, once something is identified, what happens with that information? And how is that information evaluated? That. Lisa, the court rule actually speaks to that. It says oh, good. that if you find domestic violence, you kind of have to stop and then you um, go through that because it can't be referred. It says that right in there that it can't be referred. For example, if there's a PPO, it can't be referred. And then depending on where you are in the DV spectrum, if you will, um, mm -hmm. the time I think it can be done is if the injured party, for lack of a better word, but if the court rule says it a little differently, it's the protected party, um, mm -hmm. says it in writing that they want to go forward. I'm not sure okay. counties, do, but it's right in the court rule. Okay. So I and think that, that's, that's a good chance to talk about that written consent form that we, that we oh, have too. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pull that up too. So how's that? Awesome. I'll show that in the screen in just a second. Go ahead. You talk about it and I will pull it up. 
So, yeah, so there is a written consent form because that is what the court rules uh, specifies. So uh, SEAO, although we, they were not required uh, to prepare a form for this, they, they still did one. So that's why it doesn't have a code. It's not called FOC 126 mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. along those lines because they weren't required to, to offer this form, but they, they did. Um, and so this is a way of uh, making sure that you get something in writing on these because that is exactly what the court rule says, as Sahara said. Um, and then are there steps that you can take to cure, which um, it's, uh, again, with Zoom, it is a little bit easier to, to, to cure uh, some of the DV situations um, by, by using Zoom and not being needing to be in person. Um, but yeah, um, and then if it can't be resolved, then that's something that may need to be a report to go back to the court to say, this could not be resolved. Sorry, judge, uh, we, we tried, um, but it wasn't able to be resolved. So now there's gonna need to be further action by the court on this uh, because we weren't able to resolve this. So there is, there are, it doesn't just sort of like stop. <laughs> there's there's some, some options uh, to kind of move forward. I think another, uh, uh, like a good practice point is, is that one of the things that is becoming a, a is a, seems to be a recurring problem for some front of the court offices who filled out. Um, and so they are trying to do mad scramble on the day of the fig, right? And so um, if you have a client who is going to a fig and you can fill that out and, you know, encourage the prodding to get that thing filled out in advance, that'll make the process go a lot smoother because that seems to be happening in, in courts that are doing a lot of figs. They're just not getting the, the forms filled out. And that seems to be a, a bit of an issue for them. Can I just make uh, a list plug, Lisa? Go, go ahead. Yeah, please. For the attorneys that are present, if they could get their clients to please fill out those forms, it makes everybody's life easier. Yeah. That's the thing. So I think once attorneys and practitioners know that these forms are out there and we're looking for them. So have your client fill them out. That's really kind of an issue that we sometimes have with parties just actually submitting forms. And should they be doing it in every case so that you have eliminated domestic violence or just submit it when there is an issue? I think they should submit it in every that. time. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, Sarah. And I would say every you time. You tell your clients every every party has to fill this out. We are not accusing you of anything by asking you to fill it out or, or we're not accusing your spouse of anything by having you fill it out. Everybody has to fill these out. Um, and like the and I think this financial is forms, you're not accusing people of hiding right. assets, just everybody has to do it. How, how much um, time is there between the time you're informed that there is going to be a, a, a conference or some sort of process at the friend of court until is it like a 14 day notice period or there's nothing in the court rule that says <laughs> so you, really? you're gonna have you're probably gonna have wide variance there uh depending on where you are but, um so Go we've ahead. always we get it so when we do a fig it's after a court order so you've we're going to get the court order from the judge, then we're going to send out the FOC 124 and we're going to set an appointment probably a week or two out and say, all right, please get this back to us before we, you know, we move forward. So, um, you know, that would be our, our process, but yeah, there's, I, I could see in other counties being, you know, we're not in our in the circuit court building, so uh, you know we're in a separate building. But if you if we were, I could very easily see a judge saying, "Hey, uh, go on downstairs, and uh, <laughs> there's a friend of the court worker there who might be able to do a fig." So I could see um, that they're not being much noticed too. I mean that that could happen too. Any any feedback about Kent, Ottawa, Oakland about the timing? Yeah, I think I think the conferences in Ottawa tend to be two or three weeks out. Mm. Um, they give us a reasonable amount of notice. To the extent that the troubleshooting conferences in Kent are run under the FOC ADR court rule, and I don't see how they can't be, um, you get referred on Friday for a conference the next Thursday. So, so this discussion is prompting me to think the judges ought to hand out the screening forms in court on Friday, or, or if they're having Zoom hearings, notify people where to find them so that they can fill them out and send them in because that's not very much time. 
So shouldn't the notice, I mean, wouldn't it be most efficient if the notice that tells you that you have this thing to attend also says here, by the way, go fill this out and turn it in? Well, the, sometimes that notice is the judge telling you orally on Friday morning. Got it. Morning. Got it. <laughs> do, I think I'm curious. Counties. Yeah, I'm curious as to other counties that do it um, verbally. That's that's a new one for me. So well, if anybody. One of the things I would say, it's not a formal hearing, right? It's it's mm -hmm. it's really not something that there's you don't, not necessarily a formal notice for it. So right. It's However. A, <laughs> <laughs> the non the informal not a hearing can result in a recommendation that becomes an order of the court that can be deemed a final order so like i Definitely. think there you know has to be some not formality necessarily but some seriousness given to the process sure. if that makes sense sarah Hare, what were you going to say about um oakland yeah no i i'm pretty positive i think i'm almost positive ours does go with the notice and we don't have the same day plan we don't have like you go see your family and you know counselor or custody and parent time specialist the same day it's weeks right so they do have time to fill it out it's just the problem comes back to they don't complete it isn't that part of partly a function um the, the notice issue oakland county might give a lot more notice because it's a larger county who everything has to be, you can't just do things last minute because there's not just people sitting around waiting for folks to show up whereas a smaller county might be able to have that um process of making things happen more quickly um and and do we have a sense about what the friends of court around the state are doing if if a form has not been submitted are they are they asking for it or you know what's going on do we have any sense about that my, my experience, and not with very many, is that if one of the lawyers doesn't bring it up, they don't pay attention. Yeah. Um, we do have. I encourage people to talk to their friend of the courts about it. Um, we, we are getting some questions, um, and one of them has to do with this DV proto protocol. Um, I, I think it's okay that I mentioned who's asking the question. I guess they'd tell me if they didn't want me to mention their name. Um, Serafina Coffin brought up the point that in for mediation training, um, there, the domestic violence protocol is to not put it in writing. And it's like, it's really interesting that it's the exact opposite for this process. Um, I don't know, like we've had, you know, we had the Pullman case that, that went to the Supreme Court and the family law section was involved in that as an amicus where um, I think we ultimately found out that the screening did happen, but again, it was not in writing, which is consistent with what Serafina is um, sharing with us. But then there was no documentation of it. So when one party says it didn't happen, what are you supposed to do? Whereas here, there's going to be documentation. I think the, the fear is that can that documentation then be used by an abuser to, you know, further abuse or, you know, or, or somehow even used against the domestic violence victim um, in the court process? I don't know if you have any thoughts about the fact that it's actually in writing pursuant to the process that's been created under this court rule. But it's not discoverable. So how are they going to see it? I don't know. Well, Is it for you, Tony? Yeah. I mean, in reality, if the parties are still living together, somebody may be filling out that form with somebody else standing over their shoulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or somebody could be filling out that form for their for their girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and I mean, that's, I can see both sides of it. I understand why friend of the courts and scale wants something to be in writing, but the court rule also obligates the friend of the court worker doing the FIG or mediation or a joint meeting to continue to screen throughout the process. Mm. That's going to be an oral process and to follow right. up on it. The fact that somebody fills out one of those forms and says, I have no problems, nothing's ever happened. That does not mean there are no problems and nothing's ever happened. It means the person is at the point in the abuse cycle. I mean, it could mean that nothing's ever happened. Of course it could. Most of the time, nothing's ever happened. But if it is a domestic violence situation, it can mean the person's in a place in the abuse cycle where they believe that it's their fault and that they deserve whatever's happened to them or, or that their children will be hurt if they say anything. And, and so, I mean, it's, it's a very pernicious situation 
in certain kinds of domestic violence situations. I think that's spot on. I mean, that that's definitely the issue. And I think it was really good point to say that that the um, one of the training requirements for anybody who is going to do a fig or do mediation is to do domestic violence training, right? So that's that's a part of the mediation training. It's a tar- it's a requirement for fig training, so that the friend of the court worker or the mediator, if you're farming that mediation out like we do, is is identifying um, domestic violence situations and and looking for power and control issues and those sorts of things. So that that's happening throughout the process and, and it's not just the form. I do think to Lisa's question about the form, which Sahara kind of pointed out, but the one of the things that the court rule says is that most, most everything in the FIG is not confidential except for the DV information. And that DV information is confidential. And the FOC has a ton of confidential information that it doesn't give out um, already. So that's not really, so to compare us to a private mediator, that might be one of the reasons why it would be a little bit different is we have a ton of information that we can't give out already anyway. So that's something there's already a, there's already a process there's already a process in yeah, place we, to protect we already tell, information we already okay. tell you guys no you can't have stuff all the time anyway so it's okay. easy for us to do um so no problem. tony's a no man <laughs> <laughs> um great this has been super helpful so we have two more broad topics that we're going to cover with the time that we have left just to give everybody a preview um because i know there's some questions coming in that um we are going to get to i just want to share with you where we are our next topic is how to use the fig c or ADR processes to your client's advantage. And then our last topic is problem areas we've seen and maybe appeal issues that might come out of this process. So turning to the how to use the big C and other ADR processes to your client's advantage, um, do we have any sense for how many cases are being resolved through the big C process? And I hear a resounding silence. <laughs> if you have any instincts in your counties please put it in the chat well, we know do we know do we ever have data about the conciliation process just by way of comparison yeah i'm, I'm sure that people keep track of how many orders that come out of big c's are are request you know requested de novo what percentage of the orders are consent um mm-hmm. i know ottawa county's conciliation process had a very, very high percentage of consent orders coming Mm -hmm. out. And and then of the ones where a recommendation was made, even of those, a very low percentage did they ask the judge to look at them de novo. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it has a lot to do with a couple of things. How well trained your, um, your FOC worker is and how consistent your judges are. If, if people know that the friend of the court and the judges are in tune and have similar values and are likely to see things the same way you learn pretty quickly that that your best bet is by far and away being as well prepared as possible for the friend of the court conference because you're not likely to get a different result in front of the judge but shouldn't you be prepared either way right isn't that the whole idea of getting your client to understand the process and what their role is right? So I always say when we send people to our joint meetings, right? I like attorneys that are reasonable, but sometimes we have unreasonable attorneys um, and they want to be there. And like, you know, they cannot be excluded, but I think it's the idea of the reason you're there is for compromise, right? The whole reason you're there is so you can have ultimate input into the final decision. Nobody wants to submit a recommended order that somebody's going to be unhappy with. You're trying to get parents to move towards the middle, right? So one person's over here, you should never see child, and the other one's like, I want 50-50 or whatever, right? Whatever the issues are. And so the idea is if they kind of know in advance, the whole process is to get you towards the middle so you have input into the final order. And those are kind of my words. I always say to parents, um, it's all about your children, right? We all say that. It's all about your children, and nobody likes another adult to tell them what to do. And we want to give you as much um, input into the final order because you are much more likely to find agreement if you have input into it than the court telling you the way it's going to be. So when we mm-hmm. start that premise and we get them to that place, and if that's where they come from, they're more likely to result in a consent order rather than the front of the court worker telling them the way it is. 
So who are the people that serve in this role of the big C, the, co the conference, I don't know what to call them. In, I guess in Ingham County, we call them investigators. We used to call them conciliators, whatever the term is um, that serve in this role. I was going to say, probably there's a lot of different names, I would say, for, for who's doing this. Because, um, uh, yeah, what what's a caseworker in one county is a mm -hmm. different thing in another. Mm -hmm. What's a, yeah. So maybe this would be helpful to know. This would be a good time to say, like, what the training of the people who are doing it. Because yeah. we called anything, right? So um, whatever name they have could be a lot of different things. So they have to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree in um, in a related field. So education, uh, social services, those sorts of those sorts of fields. They have to um, have two years of experience as a caseworker, whatever that means. Again, depending on your county, what that means. And then there's a training program and there's a bunch of different uh, elements of the, the training program that have to be covered. Um, like a DV was one of the, the categories there, but mediation, role-playing, all sorts of that sort of stuff. Uh, familiar with family, uh, family law, familiar with the uh, Custody Act, those sorts of things. And then they have to do two mediation, be observed doing a mediation. They have to they have to observe two mediations or figs, and they also have to have continuing education of eight hours of training every two years um, to stay up to stuff. So that that's one of the things that it's there's there is actually a very specific list of things that you you have to be able to do to be able to do this work. So whether we're called what we're called, I guess, is probably irrelevant, but it's a, um, a lot of, there are very specific uh, requirements. But, but to your point, point, Tony, currently the process to be, uh, I'm going to call it an investigator uh, with a friend of court is more, it requires more knowledge of family law than what's required to be a family law judge. Yes. Um, although That's soon to change, right? That's soon to okay. change. So there'll be some yeah, MJE, so I, think, I think they're calling it, but yeah, I don't know me, that they're going to specifically me, in family law. <laughs> yeah, let me add a couple of things to that. Um, Tony forgot to mention that it, that a JD is deemed as good as an undergraduate degree in education, psychology, social work, one of those related fields. So lawyers can serve. Um, and and oh, there I had one other point that I'm now. Oh, they they specifically talk about having good people skills good communication skills, good ability to interact with the public. And, and I wanted to say, I, I remember a story a colleague told, he was interviewing for a new legal assistant or paralegal for his firm. And a, a young woman came in to interview who had just graduated from college. And he asked why she was interested in this. And it's because she had like an internship during her last semester at college where she was running conciliation conferences and making custody and parenting time decisions for the court. And that's why she knew she'd be a really good assistant for him. And I was just like, oh my God. So I am really, really happy that the new court rule required training requirements and that SCAO, who, friend of the court bureau, I'm assuming who came up with these, came up with some really good ones. I think that serves the families well. And Sahara posted a link in the chat um, with those training requirements. Thank you, Sahara. Um, so one of the, the big differences, I think, between what existed before in the counties that use conciliation and with the, the newer FIGSI process was that most counties, if you were going to conciliation, they did not allow attorneys in the room. Mm -hmm. Technically, I don't think that was a rule, but that was just the practice. Um, so the question is, are attorneys when, when parties are represented at least, are the attorneys attending the fig C or um, are people going it alone? Um, I've had clients do it both ways. Um, it, it in large part depends on what they think the issues are gonna be. Um, there are a lot of mediations in family in Kent County that happen without attorneys in the room. Um, and, and so the idea of sending your client to the friend of the court without you is something that, that attorneys here tend to be more comfortable with than I hear that they are in other parts of the state. Mm. Um, 
part of that may be that we know we can get in in front of our judge if the the friend of the court worker if, if the client forgets something that was really really important so the decision is really really wrong which doesn't happen very often we can get in in front of a judge pretty quickly if, when you heard about cases up in northern lower michigan where it was three or four months before you could get in for for any kind of a hearing to try to correct something that happened at one of these conferences, I would be much less likely to say to a client that it's worth saving the money to go by themselves. Um, and and uh, Katie Conklin um, posted a couple of things in the chat and one of them is, and she's up north in Presque Isle County. Um, they do take a long time as Katie pointed out. And also um, I'm going to just read what she said, Katie, because it's really good. Important decisions and unintended consequences can come from these FOC meetings without attorneys. And, and that is particularly true if you're going to need to object. Maybe you could have avoided having to object to it had the attorney been present. Um, anyway, uh, I, I think it's really, I, I personally think if I, if my, I would not want my client to go it alone. Um, if, I, if they had already come to me to hire me to represent them, even if I'm kind of sitting in the back seat um, with the process, I would want to be there to make sure that they understood what was going on. Because I just see so many times where, you know, whether it's mediation or some other process, after, the next day people are like, well, I didn't really understand what I was agreeing to. And I think it's less likely to have that said if the attorney is there for the process, just my personal opinion. Um, Somebody, um, who is this? Oh, Phil, um, did I hear the qualifications? <laughs> yes, I said that, the qualifications to be an investigator are great because they don't require you to have like a background in family law to sit on the family law seat. That's just the truth. Um, that may change with the new MJE requirements, although I'm not sure that specifically requiring family law judges to, to learn family law as it is just to, to be have continuing judicial education credit. So, um, and just so you know, Phil, because you uh, you may not see the post if you just showed up late. Sahara posted the requirements uh, in the chat. If you can't see them, let me know, and I will um, repost them for you. Um, so let's. On the, um, sorry, Lisa. On the yeah. could it, on the should an attorney be a present thing? One of the things that I think is important for everybody to know is that so. After a fig, there's some different options as far as like what uh, what could happen, right? Yes, so, that's our next discussion. Oh, Absolutely, go ahead. No, you uh, you take the lead. <laughs> all right, fine. <laughs> so the the in because there are different options. One of those options is something that I know most attorneys are going to probably want to be involved in, um, and I'll jump to that one first. If there's a consent, the parties can sign it right there, and there is no objection. Uh, so the the three other options are all a recommendation uh, where to the court where there could be an objection process. But if the parties consent right and then then and there, which is in generally the goal is to try to reach a resolution. If if the parties consent to it, then there is no objection. So that I think is a kind of tie in about why it might be important uh, court which yeah. has to be very, one option is that a recommendation goes to the court with a detailed um, uh, going through each of the best interest factors, all the sort of stuff. And then the court approves that. And then after the court, approves, the other is that it goes out to the parties and they have a 21 day objection. And if nobody objects, um, then it goes to, to the court for approval, which is much more like the Rev mod process or the uh, referee recommendation process in most most counties, or there could be a recommendation to go to the court to just say I couldn't do this for whatever reason. We need your help, um, which could be the DV situation, or it could be other situations where it wasn't uh, able to be resolved. And then that final option, like I already pointed out, was if the parties sign off on a consent right then and there, then there is no objection process, and then a, a motion would need to be filed. So um, one of the kind of practice tip thing that I would say that would be really helpful is make sure you know uh, which one of those routes is gonna <laughs> be taken in your county because all four are, are available. So if you, uh, you don't wanna be surprised about which one <laughs> it's gonna be. Right, and, and not like we've said earlier, not all counties are using the same process. And in like in Genesee, it's only if a court orders it, do they go to the FIGC. So, you know, it's just 
sometimes in some counties it's used heavily and others it's used very rarely um so if I, we were going to do we would do a recommendation and then allow mm -hmm. the parties to object within the 21 day time period so we would choose that path or hopefully consent i mean generally if, if it's coming to us hopefully we are able to resolve well, it and i wanted to point out the court rules envision the possibility that the parties agree on some things but not on everything and so under the court rule if 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 they agree on let's say physical and legal custody but maybe they're not really aligned on what the parenting time schedule should be the big C investigator can then make a recommendation on that piece of it, which would still allow an objection on that piece of it, not the part that they actually agreed to, right? Is that my understanding of the court rule at least? Um, so the big, I think the big issue, like from an appellate perspective is if, you know, we're, if you have a recommendation that you don't agree with, you object. So the first question is, you know, that proceeding wasn't recorded. Um, you probably had an attorney representing you, but maybe not. Um, where does your objection go? Does your objection go to a referee who then holds a hearing? Or does it go directly to the judge? Does it depend on the county? Yeah, and depend on the county, I, I think. <laughs> um, for us, it would be in front of a referee. Um, but yeah, I, uh, that's a, a big depend on the county um, type of thing. Um, Sahara? Yeah, I said depends on the county. Um, it, it depends on how it got to where it got to. So for example, if the ADR is more in the order of reference, which is a different one where the, she does make a recommendation, right? Um, that's, that objection is going to the judge more than likely, right? But if it's mm -hmm. other process, if it's a joint meeting, that could end up with the referee. That so one of, the, two things. one of the things to be aware of, I guess, if it goes directly from the big C investigator to the judge, um, well, I guess even if it goes to referee, there's a lot of information sometimes that's in a recommendation, right? Because sometimes they, I, I, I'm imagining at least, because that's at least how it was with the conciliation process, the recommendation is not just a one page, this is what I recommend. It's like making fact findings. And, and part of the problem with having a big C investigator putting all those fact findings and, and or even a factual recitation um, in writing is that then the next person up the line, whether it's a referee or a judge, is then reading that, which may be based on hearsay evidence, right? Because the rules of evidence do not apply at the big C, whereas they do apply at the referee hearing or the judicial hearing. And so I think from a, a power perspective, it's a concern that the, that, the, that the jurist, whether it's a referee or a judge, is actually reading the details from a big C recommendation that may persuade them without actually being admissible evidence. I don't know if you, anybody here has comments about that. It's just something that I've had a problem oh, with. I remember reading maybe in the court rule that the evidence rule that allows admission of a custody investigation um, and consideration that does not apply to the recommendation after a fig C. So the core rule recognizes that it's a less formal and a less mm -hmm. reliable process. Um, hopefully the judges or referees who are hearing those cases would appreciate that and would be able and willing to step up and take responsibility for making an initial determination, not treating it as, you know, a review of somebody who'd done a comprehensive right. job, because it's hard, even even good friend of the court workers in the limited amount of time and, and space that they have to make their recommendations, they have to accept that that, you know, th there can be serious mistakes, no matter how hard they try. Uh, another point from, were you going to say something, Tony? I was going to say this, um, the summary report that FOC 125 is very detailed. Uh, so I think that would be another uh, good link to have available. What was interesting is that uh, I, when SCAO was talking about um, wanting to, um, what to do with this, the FOC 125 is they wanted it to be details because the the court could be approving it 
just based on the writing. So they wanted there mm -hmm. to be enough information in there so that the court could make an independent finding, um, that there would be enough information for them to say, yes, I, I do think that th this is worth approving, which of course, as you pointed out, Lisa, making I, an independent finding based on this, on the information that's in there. So as you kind of Summer pointed report. out, that's, it's a little, it, <laughs> You don't want it to, it gets to this sort of like, you don't want it to go just, just go through without there being any findings in writing, but then the more findings you put in, then it gets into this sort of like, I'm making an independent judgment based on the information that's in there. So it's, uh, it's uh, that's a challenge. I, I, I can totally see where you're going there, uh, but I also see where uh, SEO is saying, well, I don't want it to just be hey, here's the order um, with no detailed discussion of the best interest factors either. So it uh, it kind of went, but I see where it goes a little bit both ways. As a practical there. matter, a lot of people go to these conferences because they start without lawyers. And then after they get their first bad result, then they decide, geez, maybe I better hire a lawyer. And so having that kind of detail is really helpful to the lawyer because you can go through then with the potential client well, is this true? Is that true? Is the other thing true? You know, did you have a chance to say this? Did you tell them that, but they didn't, you know, believe you what's what? And then you can tell them, you know, hey, you can hire me, but I'm probably not going to get you a different decision from the judge in light of those facts. You know, and you can make a better informed decision about strategically if the client is better off objecting and fighting it, or maybe if they're better off taking a parenting class or mm -hmm. or voluntarily picking up a few more hours at work or doing something else that will help make their life and their children's lives better and get them then a better result down the road instead of just arguing about a decision that's likely to be upheld. Um, I am getting some private messages about people asking about whether certain counties are um, using the process. So I just want, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna throw out a couple counties and if you happen to know, um, I know Sahara often is um, tuned into a lot of things around the state. Um, for example, do you know if they're using the Fig C process in Wayne County? No. You don't know or they're not? I don't think they are, but I'm not positive. They do okay. their FAME program that does it. Right. Okay. So is that sort of the yeah. alternative to Yeah, they don't, I don't, I can't imagine I'm sure there's other people that are on here that could speak to it more than me, but I can't imagine they have the resources for fig seed. Right. Um, and do we know about um, Jackson County? Lenaway County? Christy Drake is from Lenaway. I see she's on. And uh, Washtenaw County. Um, Jackson, yes. Okay. Is it in all cases, um, Lauren, or is it just when it's ordered by the court like it is in Genesee? All cases. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so there's like a lot of issues that come up, appeal questions. Um, you know, how do you appeal a fig C if there's not a transcript? Well, you're not actually appealing the fig C, right? You're, you're, you're objecting it's gonna go before somebody where there will be a transcript based on that objection, but it's not, you're not gonna have any record of what actually happened. Um, I guess the only advantage to the big C on, from an appellate perspective is at least you know that the attorney was there that they can maybe tell the appellate attorney, not that it matters because it's not on the record, but like you can get a sense of, of what happened and maybe that will help make a better objection if the attorney was present. Um, but it is an issue that there is no record of the proceeding um, I heard well, Lenawee well, County is, is not using it. Yeah. Lisa, is that a practice pointer then? If you were objecting to what happened at a fig C, put in your objection a summary of as much of the facts about what happened, what your client said, what the other person said, so that you have something that's in the court record? I would think to the extent that it, what the attorney perceives to have happened is different than what is stated in the paper that's prepared by the investigator because otherwise there's going to be like oh the investigator said this happened well actually my recollection is it was actually something else i think that would be appropriate to put in an objection that the yeah. findings are contrary to i mean i think what do you think sahara well i guess if we just kind of step back for a second this is really a form of adr 
right? This is not a court proceeding. That's why it's not recorded. So when we're really looking at what the purpose of this court rule is, the idea is to reach resolution, right? So that's why it's not recorded, except for the mediation component of this. Mm -hmm. rule, everything else is really not confidential, right? And so I agree. I mean, what one parent says is completely different than what the other parent hears. Mm -hmm. That's pretty typical for a lot of cases. But I think we're really attached to it being recorded or not recorded. That's not the intent. This is not a hearing. Right. This is really an informal meeting with right. trying to help you move forward. I, I agree with that, Sahara. The problem is that it can result in a binding order. And, yeah, and so but it uh, takes months and months to do anything about. And and Lisa's this this whole discussion has me worried. If you go with your client to the Fig C and the friend of the court worker writes down that your client admitted that they did A, B, or C, and you were there, and your client never admitted that, have you become a witness in the case to the extent that you have to be disqualified? Um, or- I'm gonna play devil's advocate, Liz. So did, did that worker do it as an error? because it was just an error or did miss her they misheard or something or yeah, something like that it, yeah because i think that's your say say oh my gosh i want the the order to reflect that that wasn't true i'm sure that was an mm -hmm. say i don't think anyone intentionally puts things in a in a recommended order that really isn't there right and we all make mistakes and we don't right. see so what do you do i can, I can say that yeah so so what do you do i mean if you put just put in your objection you know, this recommendation was based on facts A, B, and C. Fact B is not true, you know, that the client did not say that they they smoked marijuana and took cocaine. They said, you know, they they saw somebody else smoke marijuana and, and take cocaine, and so they got their kids out of there. And, and I'm assuming the Fig C workers then don't show up at the court hearings, although sometimes in Ottawa County, they would be there in case the judge had a question. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's just, it, I'm still not a huge fan of, of recommended orders coming out of informal processes, even though mm -hmm. this is a much better informal mm -hmm. process than what used to happen before the court rule. And this is one of the reasons why. Right. Completely. Uh, Lisa Schmidt asked whether the summary would be excluded as a settlement discussion. I think the answer is no, because it's an actual non-confidential court document. Right. And even though the intent is to settle, the court rules, you know, allow it to go beyond that when it doesn't settle. I think Except that's for the mediation cool. component. That okay. was confidential. Yeah. Um. So I, I, Philip asked about when the jurisdictions aren't using the process, do we have any insight into um, why they're not using the process? And I think earlier we said it was, you know, the counties that did conciliation kind of have adopted the big C to replace it. Um, and so that may be part of the answer. Is there another answer that any that you're aware of? I, I recall discussions um, I mean, first of all, the, the court rule doesn't require every county to have all the processes. It just requires them to have at least one. Mm -hmm. And and my and each county was each county friend of the court was given the ability to write their own plan to decide what they're going to have. So so it would amaze me if it wasn't a combination of money mm -hmm. and personnel and natural reluctance to change. Right. That's that's a it's really a good answer, resource. Liz. <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry. It's a huge resource difference. So uh, being from a poor county, um, we uh, we don't have very many parenting time workers. Uh, most of our staff in our office are child support workers because the we're two thirds federally funded if we have that. Um, and everything that's parenting time is 100% county funded. So I can only have so much work done by staff who are being 100% county funded. It's just not, it's just not realistic. Um, and then yes, to the point of the conciliation, the other thing is that the training requirements are uh, a little bit more laborious. So, and, and the forms are too, um, than what some counties are used to. So the, the report form is several pages long and it's pretty detailed. Um, the, the training requirements can be 
uh, difficult to achieve, uh, especially in a, in a county that maybe you only have one caseworker and they've been there for a year. Well, they're they're excluded already. So, um, you know, the, these are there's a there are some some difficulties there uh, along the way. And for us, we've used a community resolution center for mediation. We have a great relationship with them. We've referred a lot of cases there. Um, so we we use them as our mediators and then we don't it's not being done in house. Um, and so so sometimes the community resources that you have just are better suited for, uh, you know, an outside agency to be handling uh, those efforts. So um, we have one last question, and it's one that's near and dear to my heart. So I want to make sure we have time to ask it. Are the FIGC investigators being asked to decide the threshold issue of for parenting time or custody cases? Or are those decisions being referred to them after the judge has made that decision about the threshold. In, in Kent County, the judge would not send any kind of anything over to friend of the court for a modification without at least looking at the threshold issue, although it's often our referees rather than the judges who have the hearing that make that decision. Um, I, I don't know subjectively in Ottawa um, because I've been told that they do send the threshold question to the big C investigators, okay. what's coming from the chat, okay. which all is, I mean, in, in my opinion, it's contrary to statute because the statute opinion. says if you're sending it to investigate for an investigation, the decision for the threshold has to be made by the judge. Um, I, the question is, does that apply when you're sending it to referee hearing? Well, or okay. is it is information gathering and helping them try to settle an investigation that starts the dispute? Well, if it's not big C, what is it? What would be the quote unquote investigation? Or is it because the statute hasn't kept up with the court rules? Yeah, and so, so there's a whole separate process for a custody investigation report and recommendation uh -huh. that's different from the big C process. And that's the one that I'm sure you cannot start, or you shouldn't mm -hmm. under the statute start mm -hmm. it without a threshold finding. And that, but isn't that going to depend on the county whether they have that well, type of whether process? Whether or not they're following the statute depends on the judge. Lisa, you wrote a whole book about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the plug, Liz. <laughs> I think I owe you a glass of wine. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay, this has been great. We're almost out of time. So I don't know if you have any closing comments, our panelists, um, you've been so wonderful. If you have any closing comments that you wanted to share with our audience. Um, if you do fine, and if not, we'll wrap it up. I have to say one quick thing. I think you've got to know your judge, you've got to know the referee, you've got to know your FOC worker, right that and you've got to know which of those three processes you're using. And know then, your county, right? Yeah, for, absolutely. And if you're in that county where you believe that your judge is going to rubber stamp your FOC, then you should know that, right? You wouldn't send your client alone. So you just need to be prepared. I feel like anything else, that's what you would do. Yeah, and I think uh, so get the get the forms filled out. Make sure you know what the recommendation process is actually going to look like in your county. Um, I think those are huge. And then as Harris mentioned it several times, um, the goal is to resolve it's it's an it's, it is an adr process and so if you have your that kind of hat on as you look at this stuff that that does kind of change your perspective about some of some of the issues is that the goal is really just to see if we can resolve this quickly if we can't this isn't a good process for it uh, it's just really a, intended for those cases that can be resolved quickly yeah and and that's a great reminder i you know was getting ready for a trial right before jumping on here and i probably had the wrong hat on cuz I'm worried about getting the wool pulled over my eyes about something. And, and if you go in with good faith and your client and the other party think they can settle, they probably can. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. And next month, our March topic is on the UCCJEA. Exciting stuff. So we'll see you next month. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Stop the recording.